two places, to Philippians and also to the book of Philemon. We're going to be back there for a little bit tonight. But first, I have to ask you if you, if you completed your homework, if you did the sentence flow, uh, if you did that and wrote it down, would you raise your hand? Just kidding. Uh, I, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, um, I recognize for a lot of people that is a, it's, it's a challenge, especially, if, you know, talking just last week and going back and looking at the video and thinking about <laughs> Even when I say, you know, participles and, you know, prepositional phrases, even now I have to, I have to go back and look up exactly what those things mean. Uh, because, you know, you, you look at it and you learn to read and you go through all that stuff in school, but then you get out of school and you never talk about it again. And so you have to figure out, even an adverb, there have been times in my life where I have to go, I have to go look up, man, what is an adverb again? What does it even do? So um, the thing about it is what excuse me, what I want us to do tonight as we begin is I want us to turn to Philippians chapter 1, uh, and I want us to look at 9 through 11. That's kind of the verses that I wanted you to look at uh, last week, and I wanted you to do a sentence flow. You know, I'm not going to check over it, obviously, um, even though Rachel wanted me to because I looked at hers, and so she was like, it's only fair that you look at everyone else's too, so... Um, I'm not, I, I'm not so concerned about that just to get in the habit of doing it, but um, uh, one of the things I do want us to talk about is I, I ask you also to make some observations from, uh, from Philippians chapter 1, 9 through 11. And so what I want us to do is I just want you to, at it, whatever you observed, if you, you can say one or whatever, uh, that when you were reading through that, something that you noticed that stood out to you. Remember, observations, right, are not interpretations. Observations are those things when we look at the text that are undisputed from the text, right? So, what are some observations that you notice from uh, Philippians one nine through eleven? Whoever wants to start can start. We're gonna pray at the end, by the way, for the list. But okay, Paul prayed for them. Yep. Undisputed, right? It's my prayer. <laughs> what else? Yep. Yeah, there's there's an appeal for wisdom and knowledge and discernment. Yep, that's good. What else? Okay. <laughs> That is an easy way to remember it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's good. Even still, I like that. One of the things I noticed right off the bat in, in verse 9 is it starts with and. Right, it can it's connected. So even though we're only looking at one section, really, what you end up doing as you work through a whole book of the of the Bible, like in Philippians, for example, what you start noticing is how these sections are are connected to each other. That's going to be important for our conversation moving forward tonight. But that's one of the things I notice is he's, this section specifically starts with with and, so it connects us back to those introductory sort of remarks that we talked about from the first part of Philippians chapter 1. Another thing I noticed too, uh, also in verse 9, is he talks about, it's my prayer that your love may abound, and he says more and more, right? It's one of those things like, you, you look at it and you're like, okay, so it's, a, it's an emphasis. When, when you're looking at Scripture and you read a sentence, and then you read the next sentence, and it sounds like the sentence you just read. What that is in Scripture is it, it's the writer repeating, and, and repetition always means emphasis. So it's always emphasizing something. And so here, uh, of course, the more and more we, we see that it's emphasizing the, the, this prayer that he has for them, that their, their love would be growing, and, and out of that love, which 
it's kind of getting into what we're going to talk about tonight, but that there's wisdom, there's knowledge and discernment, wisdom, yeah. What else? What else? Anything? Going once? Going twice? The good news is there's not really a right or wrong answer. These are observations, so it's whatever whatever you observe from the text. So, um, <clears throat> One of the things, too, in verse 10, it talks about um, this, the day of Christ. I think that's, that's, to me, that's another interesting thing, right? Especially when you look back, uh, or even if you look forward to verse 11, right? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through through Jesus Christ. So, you have this sort of the day of Christ that's, that is alluding, it seems to be alluding to a specific day, right? And I, I would argue it is alluding to a specific day, his, his return, right? His second coming, where you'll be uh, pure and blameless, as opposed to um, just his, his name in, in the next verse. Another thing that, and we'll talk a little bit of, about this in a minute, but... In, in just in some observations, the fruit of righteousness is another thing. I, filled with the fruit of righteousness, you know, I, I look at that. And I, the thing that I, the thing that I do is I, I immediately ask a question: What is that? Right? What What does that mean? Because we never want to make assumptions. We can make all the assumptions in the world, but what we want to do is we want to tie it back to the scripture. So, um, where where else do we do we see about fruit? Right, the fruit of the spirit. Right, so uh, I would uh, it it would be a safe interpretation if you were trying to figure out what the fruit of righteousness is to look back to the fruit of the spirit because the manifestation of the fruit of the spirit in your life would be a manifestation of Christ's righteousness. Right, because you don't have the fruit of the spirit if you're not gospel transformed. So <clears throat> you can do this with any texts that you're looking at is to just kind of look through here. Look through the text, make observations, write things down. I have things underlined. I have question marks. I have all kind of stuff that I, that I do when I'm working through a text. But the most important thing for us is as, we, as we're working through the Scripture is for us to, to, to break it down logically. To, you don't always have to do a, a, like I talked about last week, you don't always have to do a formal sort of sentence diagram but at least get a flow, an understanding of how this is all working together so that you can break it up into manageable sections. Because the truth is, if you just took Philippians chapter 1 and you started writing down observations, you're probably going to have, it's going to get overwhelming. Because there's a lot in Philippians chapter 1, even that we've just worked through in, in 11 verses, there's a lot more that you could you could do. And so... It's easier to break it up into these manageable sections so that, it, so that you don't get overwhelmed. Because the, this is people's natural inclination. When you get overwhelmed, you close the book and you go, you're right, you close the book. You put it aside. Because you're, you, know, you get overwhelmed, you don't know the way forward, and so it's just easier just to, to stop. And so I don't want us to get overwhelmed. I want us to break this up into manageable sections so that uh, so that when we're looking at the text, we're able to handle it uh, in a way that is consistent with th- what the text is giving us itself, but also in a way that brings glory and honor to God. We want to be a people who rightly divide the word of truth, and that's really our goal uh, in all of this. And I, I alluded to this last week, but I'm going to say it again. The study of Scripture is not about reading a lot of Scripture. For a, for a long time, it was about, you know, you're studying the Scripture if you, if you read a lot of Scripture. But I, I, that's, there's no correlation between those two things. There, you can read a lot and still be dumb, right? I mean, trust me, there are a lot of people going to college right now who are reading a lot of books, and they are not walking out of college any more knowledgeable when they walked in, Right? It matters if you're studying the text, if you're absorbing the text, if you're learning from the text. And so when it comes to the scripture, I don't want us to be of the mindset that 
it's about me tackling a lot, but it's about me handling it in a way that I can do it faithfully. And so I told you last week, sometimes it may be one, two, or three verses that I'm looking at a day. You know, I'm, I, I, that's just how it is. I mean, just, just looking at how they fit together because it's okay to do that. Because you work on three, those three verses and then you move on the next day to the next two or three verses and you move on and move on. And then all of a sudden you get to the end and you've worked through all of these verses. And if you've been doing it like we've been doing it, you're making notes, you're writing things down. And so then you open up your notebook and you go back and look and you have sitting before you, you have the, the product of you studying the text of Scripture. You have, you have observations, you have things that you were writing down as you were reading that you didn't even realize you were writing down that were really good. And then you go back and you're like, man, that's, like, that's awesome that I noticed that, that I, in the moment, that I saw that, that happening within the text. And so I want us to, <clears throat> when we're thinking about this, to, to not feel like that we, we have to, that we have to perform in this. It, studying the scripture is not about performing it is about a knowledge of the Word that changes us. A knowledge of the Word that transforms our minds, right? And so that's really our, our, our long-term goal is to be a people of the book who are transformed by the truth of the book because of who the author is, because who the one who gave it to us. Now, what are we going to talk about tonight? Tonight I want to talk about context. And we've been kind of alluding to this on and off as we've worked through, but I want to specifically in the first part tonight really focus on contextual interpretation. Why is this important? When I was in college, I uh, went to Bible college, but I also did part-time at the local university, University of Alabama at Birmingham. And there was a local news station that was asking college students that it was they were interviewing college students. I forget what it was about, but I think it was about the sale of alcohol on Sundays. Um, and, and I was a Christian. I was fairly new Christian, but they they wanted to ask me some questions, right? And so we talked for probably five minutes. And they're like, "We're gonna, you know, we're we're gonna put part of this interview on the air." And later that night, I was like, "Awesome, I'm gonna be on TV." And then my time came, and I look like the most foolish person on the planet because out of a five-minute conversation, they took literally a five-second clip and put that on TV, right? Now, I, say, I tell you that story because that's what happens. That's what we do to the Scripture when we rip it out of context. That's why we have so many denominations. That's why we have so many cults and all those other things is because people take the scripture and they tear it out of context and then they make these theological statements. I'm going to read one to you and I've been guilty of this too, so I'm not coming down on anybody in the room if you've done this. But how many times have you said, well, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst, right? How many of you have said that? How many of you know the context of that verse? And I've done this. I've said it from the pulpit. All right? I've, I've done it. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the context, that comes from Matthew chapter 18, where it talks about church discipline. So the context in which God gives us, where two or three are gathered, gathered in my name, I'm in the midst, is in the context of, of the church exercising discipline against its members, or... Are you dealing with a brother or sister who's in sin? That, that's the context of it, right? And so a lot of times what we do is like what I talked about last week is sometimes we will make these statements and we're taking, we're taking the interpretation and we're pushing it further than what the Scripture gives to us, right? And that becomes problematic. It happens in a lot of ways when I was a crazy charismatic, literally a crazy charismatic Man, I can't tell you how many times I said in the youth group, man, it, Jesus said, if you say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, 
right? If you just say into the mountain, if you tell your problem that, that God is bigger than your problem, then your problem is just going to go away and it's not going to be a problem anymore. Now what I came to learn is that's not the way things work in the economy of God. Instead, uh, God uses those things, those mountains in our life, to, and, and the context of that specific issue in Jesus' statement is an issue of faith. He says, you, you gotta, if you just have faith of a mustard seed, if you have the smallest amount of faith, that is faith enough to move mountains. Well, why is he talking about that? Well, because that's, that's, what it, that's the amount of faith it takes to be saved. In order for the application of the gospel in your life, it takes faith of a mustard seed. Smallest thing you can imagine. But that, that's faith that moves mountains. That's faith that changes hearts and lives. Right? That, that's just a couple of the things that, that I thought of immediately offhand when I was thinking about the issue of context. But I mean, there's been a ton of times where um, Scripture, someone's quoted Scripture, and it's, it's, it's trying to be really helpful, but it's really out of context. I mean, for example, I, there's a t-shirt out there that says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context, right? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is actually in the context of suffering as Christians in the world. It's not just every day. It's not just, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's when you're in the middle of suffering and hardship in this world, you can do all things. That You, you are going to overcome. You can overcome that, that hardship in your life. You, you can get through to the other side of that, right? And so context becomes an important thing for us to consider. And, and the truth is, is in the study of Scripture, context is king. Context is king. Because in the study of Scripture, the way it works is we interpret Scripture with Scripture. Right? We interpret Scripture with Scripture. It is what God has given us. It is His Word and it is everything we need for life and godliness. So, we interpret Scripture with Scripture, meaning that when I read from Romans chapter 3, I'm not just reading in, in, the, in the bubble of Romans chapter 3. I'm reading within the larger context of the book of Romans, but I'm reading in the larger context of the New Testament, and I'm reading in the larger context of the Bible. Right? And so, when we come to hard texts of Scripture... The ones that are really hard where we're like, man, what does that mean? How, how do we understand that in the world that we live in right now? What we do is we interpret the hard scripture in light of the not so hard scripture. Right? So we, when we're looking at one of these hard texts in scripture, for example, in Matthew chapter 18, dealing with sin in the life of our brother, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing confronting someone who's hurt you. But we look at that and it talks about if your brother sins against you, go to them. But, but we, we're interpreting that in the context of the larger New Testament. And what do we know in the New Testament? This is born out of love. Then we're not confronting them because we're mad or because we're hurt. We're confronting them because they're our brother and sister and they've hurt us. And out of love, we want to restore that relationship with them. And so we know that out of love, the restoration of this relationship is born out of us being given the ministry of reconciliation. Corinthians tells us that, that we have been reconciled to Christ and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Well, the only way that you're going to be able to practice Matthew 18 in a way that brings glory and honor to God, if it's born out of your love for your brother and if, it, and if the, the true goal of confronting sin in the life of your brother is reconciliation, and not revenge or anything else. So all of that comes down to the issue of context. If you think of think of it like this, the Bible as it is written, <coughs> excuse me, it's written and it's not written as a chorus where it doesn't sing in unison, right? Where it's just it, it's not a chorus where you have sopranos and altos and bass and tenors. It's not that. The scripture is written, the different books, the different voices, they're singing in harmony. So it's not just that they're singing their part, 
But when the Scripture is coming together, it is harmonious. It is, it is working together to present an overall unified message. Well, what is that unified message? Well, it's the revelation of God in His plan of redemption. It's, it's that, and that involves His character and everything else. But, but that's the way that we look at this thing in Scripture. And I want us tonight, and we haven't, we've done this a few times, but we're going to do some practical We're going to look at some practical things when it comes to context. And so what I want to do is I want to read a statement to you. And this is, there's going to be scripture involved. But I want to read and then talk about the context. The Bible teaches us that God is love, right? We know that first, uh, first John chapter four and verse eight, God is love. Therefore, we should never say that God would send anyone to hell to do that would be a contradiction to his character. Now, that is, a very, that is an actual statement. There are people out in the world right now, and that is their position, right? That there's no way hell can be real because God is love, and a God who is love, w- that he would never create a place like hell. This is why context is important. Because in 1 John chapter 4, what the author is talking about in the context is love for your brothers. And so what he's doing is he's showing us that the love that we have for one another is born out of the character of God, because God is love. So we're to, we're to imitate the love of God. We're to imitate the character of God. There's nothing in that chapter that talks about God's love and hell being mutually exclusive. It's just not there. And so what people do, well, since, since it's hard for me to understand God is love and the reality of hell, and then I'm just going to say, well, that's a contradiction of his character. Well, that's not true. And so that's not true from the context of 1 John chapter 4, but it's not true in the overall context of the scripture either. In fact, if you look at 1 John, one of the things it talks about, it talks about God's judgment, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, it talks about the judgment of God. And it defines love there, not as saving everyone from hell, but it defines love in 1 John 4, 9 and 10 as the death of Jesus. Right, so it, you can just go out there and say God is love, right? And, and last month in June in the world that we live in, that's the proclamation of a whole lot of foolish people. Well, God is love. And so we're just embracing everybody no matter what. But the truth of the matter is, is that you can do all things through Christ, through a verse taken out of context, right? Well, if you just go out there and you say God is love, what you're doing is you're divorcing that verse from the context it's in, but you're also divorcing divorcing it from the greater context of the scripture that tells us that even in God's love, there is anger and wrath and justice and holiness. All of those things are still a part of the character of God, not just His love. God is not just love, right? He is love, but He's a whole lot of other things too that make up His character. And if you don't look at the context, then you end up with a fluffy God who is that that big pillow that you grab onto, but there's never anything else outside of that. So there's never never a feel that you need to repent. Because, well, God is love, so why do I need to talk about the wrath of God and the justice of God? Well, I don't if God is love. So where is the need for repentance? The truth of the matter is, if you go online and you look at some of the churches, who celebrated Pride Month, what you'll find out about them is that their messages are devoid of the reality of repentance. And the reason is, is because the love that they understand about God is outside of the context of the Scripture. It's outside of the context in which God has delivered it. But that's not the only thing. How about this one? Yikes, this may offend somebody. If it does, sorry, I didn't write it. God did. Why are you confronting me about sin? Don't worry. Don't you know that the Bible says, judge not, lest ye be judged? Right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. 
telling me that you don't approve of what I'm doing? You're judging me? Newsflash, Matthew chapter 7 is about Jesus rebuking hypocrisy. And what he's doing there is he's creating a metaphor. And he says, he talks about you having a log, you know, right? Your brother has a log in their eye. They don't even know, but they have a log in their eye and you have a speck in your eye. And what Jesus says there is not that you don't confront sin. That's the crazy thing about it. People will say, judge not, lest ye be judged. And then the whole rest of the context is Jesus showing us what righteous judgment looks like. What the righteous confrontation of sin looks like. He says, it's not that you don't confront sin in your brother's life. It's that before you do that, you confront the sin in your own life. You deal with the speck in your own eye or the log in your own eye, right? You look at your brother and you see this little speck in his eye, but you have this huge log. He's not saying that you just don't deal with it at all. He's saying you do it the right way. And the truth of the matter is, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, the problem with that is in the greater context of the Gospels, what Jesus says is that, well, first off, bad trees bear bad fruit. Good trees bear bear good fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Jesus literally says in the parable that you must judge the fruit of the lives of the people around you. You, The church, the whole idea that church is not a judgmental place, that's only half true. We're not judging the world. We're not out there saying this is the way... I don't understand why the world's acting that way. We know why they're acting that way. They're lost. But in this room, you should absolutely be judging one another. Because if I'm doing something that is contrary to the Scripture, you better slap me upside the head and get me right. Because I'm going to do it to you. If you're doing something, that's the way this thing works. But again, we're doing it out of love. Out of reconciliation and restoration. We're doing it with a right heart. Understanding that, yeah, I'm, I have a log in my eye I've got to deal with too. Yeah, I have sin in my life that I'm dealing with too. And I'm not coming at you to, to condemn you for the sin in your life. I'm coming to you as your brother who loves you. Who wants what's best for you. Who wants your life to be a reflection of the character of God in the world that we live in. I, that's, that's judgment, though. It doesn't matter how you slice the pie. That, that is judging. But again, if you take it out of context, you can make it say whatever you want. How about this? I step on the football field. I know I'm going to win. Because guess why? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's not talking about running a race there. He's not talking about playing a game. He's talking about when your life is in chaos, when there's, especially in Philippians 4, 11, and 12, talking about adversity. When you're facing the hardship in this life, you can have contentment. You can be satisfied and fulfilled even in that moment. And so when we take that verse out of context, what we're doing is we are trivializing what Paul is actually saying there. I mean, imagine someone who's just who's going through the ringer in their life and looking them in the eye and saying, listen, you know what the, the Scripture tells us? The Scripture tells us that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That means that the, the hardship you're facing, the financial situation that you're facing, that seems insurmountable, you're going to get through. You're going to be all right. You're going to make it to the other side of this. Because again, the greater context of Scripture is for Christians in this world. All things work together for the good. That's that, and, and just so you know, all things means everything. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent. All of those things work together for the good. When you're a Christian in this world, we win, but to take it out of the context of facing adversity and the reality and the hardship of this world is to, is to make that, it, it just makes it into something that God did not intend it to be. 
And I'm not saying that everyone who does that, it, they, ha- they have a ill will. I'm not saying they're doing it out of a wrong heart. I'm just saying that context matters. And it sometimes when you say things like, well, w- for example, the judge not thing, when we're out there and, and if that's the position we take and we're just out there, well, you judge not lest ye be judged. Well, the problem is, is that eventually you're going to have to face the reality of that in, in its true context, and then you're going to be dumbfounded. You're not going to know what to do, right? Because you're going to see your brother fall into a major sin. What are you going to do? Because you've been out there preaching, why well, judge not. But now you need to look at his actions and you need to judge them so that you can tell him how twisted they are so that he can have repentance and restoration in his life. And so when, you, when we're taking things out of context, it's not just that we're taking them out of context. We are twisting our worldview. We're twisting our own understanding of Scripture. And a lot of times the enemy uses that in our lives to get our heads twisted. To where we end up where we don't even know what we believe. That's context in a nutshell. Everybody clear on context? Any questions about context? It's, it is most important when we're looking at the Scripture. Right? The immediate context, and then we go out. It's kind of like a bullseye, right? We start in the middle, dead center. And then we're, we're looking out as, the, as, the, as it goes out from the, from the chapter to the book to the New Testament, or maybe even the, uh, the set of epistles, if it's like a prison, the prison epistles or something, we look out, or pastoral epistles, we look out, 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 New Testament, Old Testament, things like that. So it's kind of like, that's the way that we work through the issue of context, and it is of the utmost importance. So, what else do we need to talk about tonight? The next thing we need to talk about is number four on uh, uh, strategies for studying the text. This is where we, we've made observations, right? Now we need to ask questions. We need to go through and we need to write down questions that we have. For example, uh, on Sunday morning, the last two Sundays, one of the, one of the scriptures we've read is uh, that God put forward the Lord Jesus as a propitiation, right? Right? So when I studied that scripture the first time, the first thing that I, the first question that I wrote down is what, what is propitiation? What does that mean? What can it mean? Right? So we need to ask relevant questions is the important part of this. Relevant questions uh, when we're looking at the text. And so I want you to turn over to the book of Philemon really quick. And I want to just talk about why it's important to ask relevant type of questions. In Philemon, in chapter, well, in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may be, may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Asking relevant questions, what does it mean to share your faith? Now, why am I asking that question now? Well, because something immediately popped into your mind when I said share your faith, right? Most of you, if you're a normal human being, when you hear share your faith, you think of verbalizing your testimony, talking about The gospel, right? That's what the majority of us think about. But here's the thing. Context. Right? Context. So, we have to ask ourselves, what does this mean in the context of Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6? What does it mean here? Well, there's a lot of indications that we could look at in the text Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother to Philemon our 
beloved fellow worker, Appy, our sister, Acrippus, and fel- our fellow soldier in the church in your house, grace to you, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray the sharing of your faith, just read that. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brothers, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Skip down to verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. In verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through uh, your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. In Philemon, sharing your faith is not evangelism. It's generosity and hospitality. It's it's those verses I just read. That's the indication. That's the context. Right? So it's important. This is, I'm hoping that this will bring home the importance of what we're talking about when it comes to studying the scripture. Because for most of us, the easiest thing for us to do is to read something like share your faith and go to evangelism and just and just think that's what it's talking about and miss the beautiful picture of what. Paul is showing us and Philemon in the text is that it's also living in light of your testimony. That would also be in the greater context of Scripture why someone like James would probably write what? Faith without works is dead. Right? Because when you come back here, we learn from Paul that sharing our faith isn't just verbalizing our testimony, but it's also the way in which we live our life. That is a living testimony of gospel transformation in our life. So when James says, again, one of the hard texts, right? Faith without works is dead. That that is a hard pill to swallow. But when we look back at the context of Scripture, what we see is, well, of course, Of course, because faith that does not drive us to live gospel transformed in the world is not saving faith. It is dead. But gospel faith, true saving faith, is faith that drives us to live different. To live as Christ has called us to live. All of this just through a conversation about context, right? And when we're looking at these things, when we see these things, again, it comes down to asking the relevant question. Because the question that I asked in the beginning, before we started this journey on this in Philemon, was what does sharing your faith mean? Right? What does that mean? So when we're looking at the Scripture, we need to ask the right questions. Those things when we're reading, we're like, man, what? I, I wonder about this. We should, we should write those things down. We should be generating a list of questions. For example, if we were looking back at Philemon, and I said, hey, I want you to go through and just make a list of questions. The first thing that I'm going to ask is, why does Paul address Appia and Acrippus? Why are they there? Rarely in the beginning of a letter does Paul address specific people unless he's addressing someone, generally speaking, in a pastoral role or a church. But rarely is he addressing a specific person, but he does it here. That, my friends, is a clue. A clue that should drive us to ask the question, well, why why is he addressing them? Another question that I would have is how does sharing your faith become effective unto knowledge? I pray 
that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. What in the world does that mean? How does, now that we understand what sharing your faith means, how does living in light of the gospel make us more effective in, for the full knowledge of every good thing? You want to know how? Well, you've got to figure it out. I'm not going to give you the answers. No. <laughs> because when we're living like that, when we're living with our eyes focused on the truth of God's Word, then we are, we are viewing everything in a right perspective. We're viewing tragedy from the right perspective. We're viewing sin from the right perspective. We're viewing love and mercy and relationship through the right perspective. And what that does in our lives is it, it, it gives us a gospel-shaded view of the world, which is the view that we want. Because it, it, it shows us the good things that, that God has done in us. That God, is, that God has changed us so that we can live this way. So that if I had a problem with Rich, I have zero doubt that I could go and sit down with him. And I know 100%, no matter how big it was, that we could work it out. I have zero doubt about that. But because he's my brother, I know that. But I also know that Rich understands. Right? I, I know through seeing him live his life, through the way that he's handled situations, I, I know that he understands the ministry of reconciliation and the importance of it to the church. So I have no doubt that he's going to apply that in the conversation. It, hypothetically, there, just so you know, this is all hypothetical. But I, I know that. But it's born. It's born out of us being gospel transformed and living in light of that gospel transformation that I know that I can go to him and that we can look at this thing from a right perspective and we can handle it the right way. A lot of the times the issue is not handling a situation, it's the perspective that we're trying to handle it from. Because most of the time, if we're being honest, it's I want to be right. I want to be vindicated. Right? But that's, that's not the way Christian brothers and sisters handle each other. Not for vindication, but reconciliation. That was all for free. All right. Another question that I would probably ask is how how did Paul meet Onesimus? Like how how did that happen? Right? We know they met and and they have formed this relationship, but how did that happen? Also, another thing that I would probably ask too is, and someone kind of alluded to this actually. But is this letter in any way manipulable, manipulative? Because it, it could kind of feel that way sometimes. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, like not in a negative way. But, but the way that Paul appeals to Philemon, is, is it manipulation? Well, I mean, kind of, but again... Perspective matters because what Paul is really doing is, is he manipulating? Yeah, but he's using a gospel perspective. He's saying, listen, <laughs> like, like I, I poured my life into you. Like, I poured everything out so that, and, and as a result, you became a Christian. God worked in your life to save you. Like, and now God has done that same work in, in Onesimus' life. And just as our relationship changed when you became a Christian, now your relationship with him has changed. Like, is that manipulative? Well, kind of. But it, again, context and perspective really matter. Because he's not doing it for, out of a wrong heart. He's doing it as a means of showing him the gospel applied. Another weird thing about, <laughs> about this, and we talked about it before, but Paul offering to pay off Onesimus' debt, but then saying to Philemon, but I know that you're going that you're, to that you're do even more than I'm asking you to do. He says, I, I'm asking you to forgive his debt, 
But if you don't, I'll pay it off. But I know that you're going to do even more than what I'm asking you to do. Like, that's weird, right? So I have questions, right? That another, again, these, just looking at the text, looking, 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 studying the text. Another thing that we talked about before, too, is uh, I'm going to have, and I have had this question about the issue of slavery, right? We talked about that, first century Roman slavery. We have questions that we need to ask about that. What does it look like? What does it mean? How is that, how is that implemented in society then? Right? Those, those are important questions that we should be asking, things that we should be looking at, right? All, all very, very important for us to consider. Now, Here's what I want you to do. You're going to have some time to ask questions because I'm like 12 minutes early. But here's what I want you to do for next week. All right? Now, the good news is this is going to be the easiest thing I'm going to ask you to do the whole time. So here you go. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 26. Philippians 1, 12 through 26. And I want you to write down questions. I want you to ask questions. And then when we get together next week, we'll work through some of those questions, right? And what I want you to do after you've looked at those questions, or you've written those questions down, I want you to read them. And then I want you to, I don't want you to write this down, but I want you to think of some observations as you read through and you're asking questions. I want you to also in your mind be making observations. And what I want you to try to do is I want you to try to come up with a main point for Philippians 1, 20, 12 through 26. I want you to look at that section and try maybe in a sentence or two to sum up what is the main point that Paul is communicating there. Right? All right. That's your assignment for next week. Context, context, context. When it comes to the study of Scripture... It's not about the amount of Scripture you're studying. It's about studying, right? It's about looking closely at the Scripture itself. Making observations. Making even interpretations that are consistent with the text. That we don't go outside of that. But it's context. That, that's what makes or breaks a good study of the Scripture. Because, I mean, listen, I'm just going to be honest with you, the way that we do things on Sunday, the way that I preach on Sunday morning, that, that is not the way you sell out arenas. The working verse by verse through the text, that, that's not the way that, that, that's not the way Joel is selling out arenas. That's not the way T.D. Jakes and all them, that's not the way they're selling out arenas. It's just not how they do it. Because when you take verses and you rip them out of context, you can make the message be anything you want it to be, right? And so you don't have to deal with, if you do it that way, like they're, like they're doing, you don't have to deal with Romans chapter 1 and 2, right? You don't have to deal with the really hard text about sin. You just get right to the part where, man, God's justified you. He saved you. You get to skip the hard stuff. But again, what we're doing on Wednesday night is I'm showing you this is how this is how I do it, right? This is every time. This is the way I'm working through a text as I'm as I'm building a sermon, as I'm coming up with a sermon. Before I write it all down, these are the steps that I've taken to get there. Now, it it just happens real fast when I do it. Not, not stretched out over however many weeks it takes us, but it happens real fast. But but I think it's important for you to know how to do this too. Because again, you never know. You never know when I'm going to come back from camp on a Friday night and have the flu and pneumonia, right? And then the deacons are like, all right, who's doing it? Right? The, per the, you know, the normal person we have to fill in is not available. So who's going to do it, right? You, I mean, you just never know. And, and the truth is, you never know when they're not going to be able to do it, right? And then what? And then what's Jay gonna do, right? Jay's got to be ready too, right? 
But I want you all to be confident enough to feel like that, that you can handle the Scripture in a way that brings glory and honor to God because that, it gives you a confidence in sharing the gospel too that you may not have if you have sort of this elementary understanding of the Scripture. Because you know people are going to ask the hard questions. But what we're doing on Wednesday nights is we're equipping you to study the Scripture so that you can answer the hard questions in a real way, not in a stumbly-bumbly way. Any questions tonight about what?